Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Live with Lon. I'm so glad that you're here to join me as we study the Word of God today. And today we have one of my very favorite passages uh, in uh, the Gospels, or in the whole Bible, for that matter. Uh, it's the story of the parable of the, uh, the uh, publican, the tax collector, and the Pharisee. Uh, and uh, we'll get there in a moment, uh, but let's pray. Here we go. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to study the Word of God today. And Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts deeply. Forgive our sin from this week and this day. Fill our heart with your Spirit. And Lord, speak to us deeply and help us uh, not to be like the Pharisee, the rabbi in this story we're about to read, but Lord, help us be like the tax collector and forgive us for those areas of our life where every one of us sometime can be like the rabbi, the Pharisee. And uh, use your word, Lord, uh, to rebuke us in those areas and to cause us to change. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and what? Amen. And of course, cause us to change with the power of the Holy Spirit, of course. Okay. Now, as I said, we're studying the Gospel of Luke. We're studying the Gospels, but we're in the Gospel of Luke. And we're uh, in the portion where uh, Luke chapter 18, where Jesus is approaching Jerusalem for the very last time. He's going to the cross, to the grave, and then uh, out of the grave, resurrected, and back to heaven. And uh, he tells a parable uh, here in this story, uh, right after telling the parable that we looked at last week about the unjust judge and how to never give up in prayer. Now he tells us another parable. And uh, as I said, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, passages in all the Bible and because uh, it's powerful to me. Uh, and I, th I hope it'll be powerful to you. Okay, without any further ado, let's go. We're in Luke chapter 18, and we begin at verse 9. New King James Version Bible. Here we go. And he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. These were the Pharisees uh, uh, par excellence. Uh, the Pharisees uh, were self-righteous uh, on steroids. And not only that, uh, but they looked down on everybody who didn't meet up to, in their opinion, uh, uh, their uh, definition of righteous. The Bible tells us not to trust in ourselves as a way of earning God's mercy and love and acceptance and getting our way into heaven. Listen, Romans chapter 3. Uh, let's look at it. Verse 20. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, by human works, no flesh, no human being will be justified in his, that is, God's sight. And what about Titus chapter 3, verse 5, which says that our salvation comes not by works of righteousness, which we have done. And then, of course, the Bible also warns us about judging uh, other people and looking down on them. Uh, Romans chapter 14, who are you to judge another man's servant? And James chapter 4, verse 12, there is only one lawgiver and judge. Who are you to judge your fellow man? So, uh, people who did this, like this Pharisee we're about to see, uh, are out of step with God in both areas, trusting in themselves that they're righteous, that they can earn their own righteousness, and looking down and judging other people. So, here comes the parable. Two men went up to the temple, that is, in Jerusalem, uh, to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. Now, uh, these two people were, uh, were polar opposites, when it came to society in ancient Israel. 
The Pharisee was a rabbi on steroids, as we're going to see. And the tax collector was a Jewish person who worked for the Roman occupation government. He uh, collected taxes, obviously, uh, but the deal was uh, the Romans required a certain amount of taxes from each city or each uh, neighborhood or however they did it. But if the tax collector collected more, then it was his to keep. And so uh, these tax collectors became rich by basically extorting uh, their own Jewish people uh, with the Roman army to back them up so the Jewish people couldn't do anything. The Jewish people at the time of Jesus, they hated these tax collectors. And uh, uh, they were the, 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 the lowest thing on the food chain in the mind of, of, of Jewish people at the time of Christ. But not only were these two guys polar opposites when it came to their standing in society, but as we're about to see, they were also polar opposites when it came to the way in which they approached the God of the universe. Let's look and see. Here we go. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Uh, I like that because I don't think he was actually praying to God. I don't think God uh, uh, hears a prayer like this and responds to it. But anyway, God. I thank you, the Pharisee said, that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Can you hear the snobbery? Can you hear him looking down his nose at, at people around him? Can you hear the incredible arrogance of this man and his self-righteousness? Uh, he goes on to say, I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, of course, we know what the word tithe means, most of us who are churchgoers, but maybe you don't. Tithe is an old English word for one-tenth, 10%. Uh, and in the Old Testament, uh, Jewish people were required to give 10% of their income, whether that income be in money or in wheat or in uh, a meat, or whatever, one-tenth of their income, milk, products, uh, to uh, the temple uh, so that the Levites and the priests who served at the temple could live off of those tithes. Uh, tithing was not worshiping God. Tithing was income tax to operate the temple in Jerusalem, and all Jews were required to give it. Uh, if you wanted to really worship God, you had to go above the tithe uh, and do a thank offering or a worship offering or, or whatever. So this guy said, I give my tithes from everything I've got and I fast twice a week. Uh, that's amazing to me. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but... I don't fast twice a week under the Lord. Uh, I don't fast once a week under the Lord. Uh, how many of you uh, fast once a week under the Lord? How many of you fast once a month unto the Lord? <laughs> how many of you fast once a year under the Lord? Uh, not that many of us. And I'll tell you why, at least for me, uh, of all the spiritual disciplines, reading my Bible, praying, memorizing scripture, whatever it may be, uh, tithing, no problem, uh, but fasting, uh, that, that's the toughest one. Waiting on the Lord is for me is the second tough, toughest one. But fasting, oh my gosh, you know, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's people who eat to live, uh, that's my wife, and people who live to eat, that's me. Uh, uh, Brenda will miss a meal and she'll say, oh my gosh, I completely forgot about lunch. Folks, I may skip a meal, but I never miss it because I forgot about it. The minute I eat breakfast, I'm thinking about what's for lunch. The minute I eat lunch, I'm thinking about what's for supper. The minute I eat supper, I'm thinking about what's for breakfast the next day. Uh, uh, I have a love relationship uh, with food. What can I tell you? Uh, uh, fasting for me 
is crazy ridiculously hard. Uh, I tried uh, uh, fasting one time, and by 6 p.m. in the evening, I was hallucinating. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I had a couple of Girl Scouts come to the door selling Girl Scouts cookies. And, you know, they win the uh, trip to New York if they sell the most. And I opened the door and I looked at them and I said, oh, you two, I think, are going to win the trip. Because uh, uh, I'm going to buy a lot of cookies. Listen, uh, this guy fasted twice a week. Uh, who does it? Who can do that? I got to give the guy props. I give him props. Man, he had religious activity uh, uh, in an amazing way. It, it, you know, in, on steroids, he did. Okay, so we understand him now. And now we turn to the other character in the parable, the tax collector. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat on his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, uh, our world today is full of people who are like the Pharisee, uh, the religious and non-religious people. Uh, uh, they don't need God's help because they believe they can help themselves. Uh, they don't need God's forgiveness because they don't feel like they've done anything wrong. They don't need God's mercy because they believe that they can earn their way out of his judgment. Uh, everything uh, that you might mention, they believe they can take care of themselves, which is exactly what this uh, parable says about uh, the Pharisee. I have a quote here from a well-known Pharisee uh, named uh, Rabbi Simeon ben Jokai. And here's what he said, and I quote, we'll put it up on the screen. L listen to this, it's a quote. If there are only two righteous men in the world, I and my son are these two. And if there is only one righteous man in the world, I am he. Now look at this, my worthiness is so great that during my lifetime, no rainbow needs to shine to ensure immunity from another great flood, end of quote. Now, are you serious? Do you remember God made the rainbow to uh, assure us he would never send another flood? Uh, you remember this? This guy said, we don't need the rainbow in my day. I'm so righteous. I, my very presence in the world guarantees that immunity. Now, we kind of chuckle because we're like, is this guy serious? He can't be serious. He was. And that's where these Pharisees were. They were serious about their self-righteousness. Now, the other guy we meet, uh, who, that we just met, is the tax collector. The tax collector doesn't come to God with any uh, uh, personal achievements to offer to God. Uh, he doesn't come to God with any religious activity, fasting, tithing, none of that to offer to God. Uh, he doesn't come to God uh, uh, thinking that he is righteous and other people aren't. No, no. He comes to God. He won't even approach uh, the prayer altar. Uh, he, he, he won't even look up to heaven because he's so gripped by his sinfulness. He's so gripped by his unworthiness. He's so gripped by his uh, degradation uh, on the inside. He's so gripped uh, by his unholiness before a holy God that all he can do is stand and beat on his chest as a sign of humility and contrition and agony before a holy God for what he is. And his prayer is not flowery like the Pharisees', Pharisees prayer was. No, he just says, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So these are the two gentlemen we have. They approach God completely differently. One self-righteously, one humbly. One confident in himself, one pleading with God for mercy. Now watch what Jesus says. He says, last verse, verse 14 
I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified. Uh, this word uh, dikaiao in the Greek, as I've told you before, means acquitted, pronounced non-guilty, delivered from all charges. He went down justified rather than the other. Watch, for everyone who exalts himself. Who was that in, in the parable? Well, the Pharisee. Everybody who exalts himself will be abased, will be brought down, uh, made low. And he who humbles himself, who was that in the parable? Right, uh, the tax collector will be exalted. Okay, now uh, that is our um, parable. Uh, the, the Pharisee didn't get any mercy from God because he didn't come asking for any mercy from God. He didn't think he needed any mercy uh, from God. And the mercy of God went to the tax collector who came understanding that he needed it and humbling himself before God and asking for it. Now, that's the end of our passage, but we uh, want to stop now and we want to ask our most important question. So, are you ready? Come on now, here we go. Come on, nice and loud. Ready? One, two, three, so what? <laughs> That's right. And how sweet. I know I, 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 I sprung that on you. Ready? How sweet. Come on. It is. As old Jackie Gleason used to say. To be here teaching the word of God together. With you. Now. So what? Say I. I, it's a great story. What difference does it make for me? Oh, my friend. Oh, my friend. This parable makes a massive difference to you and me as human beings. Listen, I was a chemistry major uh, in college. I, in fact, I graduated from Chapel Hill University of North Carolina with a BS degree in chemistry, Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry. And you know, one thing about chemistry is in chemistry, everything operates based on formulas. Uh, and you, you know, you mix X with Y and you'll get Z. Uh, and you, this is, you know, this is the way the world works. In fact, a God uh, made, has made our whole world work based upon the logic and the framework of formulas. And uh, you, you might say, well, I'm not sure I agree with that because there are things that happen in my life that look random. No, there's no random, not in God's world, where there are things that happen in my life that I don't understand. That's okay. That doesn't mean that they're not happening according to a formula. They're happening according to God's formula for your life, whether you and I understand it at a given point or not. Everything in the universe happens based on formulas that God, the creator of the universe, has set up. Now, he can suspend those formulas whenever he chooses. That's how he raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, that's how he walked on water. Okay, uh, but unless God chooses to suspend those formulas, for the whole world is grounded on them. Now, that's true when it comes to getting mercy from God. There is a formula for how we get mercy from God. And this passage tells us that formula. The, listen, uh, don't you need mercy from God? I hope you understand that you do. I do. I always meet these people who say, I want what I deserve. No, you don't. No, you don't. You do not want from a holy God what you deserve. Oh my gosh, if you got what you deserve from a holy God, friends, it would be a tragic, tragic situation. I don't want what I deserve. I want God's mercy, which I don't deserve, but that's what I want. That's what I need. That's my only hope uh, is God's mercy. And I hope you understand that and believe that too. So there's a formula as to how to tap into the mercy of God. And what's the formula? 
But Jesus just told us to it, uh, told us what it is. Listen, verse 14, Luke 18, for everyone who exalts himself will be abased, brought low, humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Oh God, please have mercy on me, a sinner. What did this guy get? He got mercy. The Pharisee, I fast twice a week and pay tithes, and what did he get? He didn't get mercy. It's just that simple. Folks, the formula is this. Humility before God equals mercy from God. Let's put that up on the screen. Humility before God equals mercy from God. You got it? That is the formula that the Bible gives us. And, and let, let me show you this. Uh, in several other places in the Bible, God says this exact same thing. Matthew 23, verse 12. He who exalts himself uh, will be humbled. Uh, Luke 14, 11, Jesus says this very same thing. He who exalts himself will be humbled. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for... God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Well, look, verse 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And this goes along with James chapter 4, verse 6, where James says, Therefore he says, God, of course, God resists the proud, but gives grace to to the humble. And we could go on. If you want to study, go to a Bible Gateway or something and Google humility, humble, humbles, and uh, and just look and see how much God says in the Bible about humility. It's clear the formula. Humility before God equals mercy from God. Now, before we close, we ought to define humility because there's probably no single commodity in the whole world that, that gets misdefined more than humility. Uh, humility is not self-degradation, self-deprecation, uh, 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 self-hatred. This is not humility. You know, I'm so bad. I'm terrible. You've heard me say this. I'm just a worm. Everybody step on me. I'm no good. See, folks, that is not true humility. That is mental illness. True humility is not trying to humble yourself in the flesh to cover up the true state of your heart, which is arrogance. You understand what I'm saying? It's not trying to cover up the true state of your heart. It's like, oh, it was a, no, I no, thank you for... No, I didn't really do it. It was a team effort. When really in your heart, you believe absolutely you did it. And you're just waiting for somebody to insist. No, you did it. Okay, well, yeah, I, no, this is not humility. Uh, 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 no, this is playing games. Uh, uh, true humility, folks, is an attitude. It is a way of seeing yourself and myself in light of the holy God of our universe. Humility is an understanding brought to us, brought to our heart by the Holy Spirit of who we really are in the flesh, what we are really made of, and what really lives inside of us that is ugly and arrogant and, and offensive to God and depraved and sinful. Yes, uh, this is so that when we come to God, we don't come to God like the Pharisee saying, I, I can do it myself. No, we come like the tax collector. We understand how sinful we are. Uh, the Holy Spirit has made us understand that. Uh, we understand in our flesh how depraved we are. We understand how unholy we are. And we understand how undeserving we are in our flesh of God's mercy, of the plan of salvation, of every good and perfect gift he's ever given us, uh, of every time he's ever been forgiving uh, towards us and merciful towards us. We understand that none of that uh, uh, do we deserve. And so we come 
uh, beating our hearts and lowering ourselves, prostrating ourselves, not just on the outside, on our knees, but in our heart, we prostrate ourselves uh, before the living God as an unholy creature. Uh, uh, this is what Isaiah said, Isaiah chapter 6. He was probably the holiest guy on the face of the earth. Uh, but he said, whoa, am I. I'm undone. I'm coming apart at the seams, he says. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Now, I don't think Isaiah was a man of unclean lips when compared to the people around him, but here talking to a holy God. You're not comparing yourself to people. He's in the presence of the holiness of Almighty God. And it absolutely rocks him to the core. Peter said, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, I am the chiefest of sinners. When we really get a glimpse of the holiness of God, uh, we suddenly understand about the unholiness of us. And the more we're in the Bible and the more we're in prayer, and the more the Lord shows us who he is, the more it should take us down in our, in, uh, uh, in our estimation of who we are. And holiness means we understand that every honor, every achievement, every success, uh, every mercy God's ever given us, we don't deserve it. It was just the kindness of God. And uh, humility means we don't get too big for our britches, folks. And it's an attitude towards God. It's also an attitude towards people. Remember the Pharisee here didn't just have a problem with his attitude towards God in that he was righteous in himself. He had a problem with his attitude towards people. He looked down his nose at them. He, he, he was a snob. He was self-righteous. He judged them harshly. Uh, a truly humble person doesn't do that. You can tell how humble you are. Uh, uh, by how you view your fellow man as well. You know, remember Jesus said, why do you worry about the speck that's in your brother's eye oh, in light of the beam in your own eye? Well, see, humble people understand that they got a beam uh, and because they, they understand what they are before God. And, and a humble man understands uh, that uh, these folks who might be struggling, uh, that he's just like them. And if you're trying as hard as you can, this is what helps me. If I'm trying as hard as I can to live for the Lord and to, and to live a, a, a life of personal holiness, and this is the best I could do, having to come in every night and confess sin after sin to the Lord I did that day, if this is the best I can do, uh, then I have no business judging these other people who are out there trying to do the best they can do in many cases. You with me? So uh, humility shows not only in how we approach God and see God, it, it, it also is how we approach people and see people. Uh, you know, we don't look down our noses at them. If anything, we put our arms around them and, and we pray for them and we, we, we sympathize with them because we're just as bad as they are if we understand what we are. It doesn't matter whether you got a doctor in front of your name or an esquire after your name you know, or what you got. It's only God's mercy that you got what you got around and behind your name. Uh, listen to me. Uh, that attic uh, on, on meth or that attic on coke or, or whatever it may be on prescription pills. You know what? If it hadn't been for God's mercy, you'd have been right where they are. Don't you tell yourself different. This is how a humble person understands the world around her or him. Now, this is the kind of person who comes to God and beats on their breast. Honestly, legitimately, uh, they're not just trying to fake God out. They sincerely understand how unholy and how sinful they are. And they beat on their breasts and say, oh, God, I'm so sorry what I did today. Lord, I'm so sorry what I thought today about others. Lord, I'm so sorry you know, for my lust today uh, in looking and thinking about people 
uh, the, uh, the opposite sex that I have no business doing that. Lord, uh, I'm so sorry about the unkind things I said today about people. Lord, I'm so sorry for the gossip today. Lord, I'm so sorry for how harshly I judged other people and the, the malicious things I said about other. Lord, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm just a sinful man. I'm a sinful woman, and I try it as hard as I can, Lord, but this, you know, I, I'm so sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. Please, I'm sorry. And you mean it. And this is the person that gets mercy from God and forgiveness from God. And you say, well, Lon, if I lived like that, wouldn't I be depressed? No, no, no. No, see, see if you say that, you've never experienced the mercy and the forgiveness of God. When God shows mercy, he picks you up and he cleans you off and he forgives you fully and he um, uh, gives you a brand new start and says, okay, tomorrow on we're going to go out, we're going to try better, okay? But his mercy is unconditional. His love is unconditional. No, 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 you don't, you, you don't, you don't feel terrible about yourself. God's mercy keeps that from happening. You just feel like you've been honest with the Lord. Okay. Well, this is the end of our passage. Humility before God equals mercy from God. And friends, this is why David said, search my heart and show me if there's any wicked way in me. It's a good prayer. Because the more we understand what the wicked ways inside of us are, the more we're able to come in real humility before the holy God of the universe. So I urge you, be in the scripture. I urge you, be in prayer. I urge you, say, Lord Jesus, show me my heart. Show me what's really there. Humble me, Lord. Uh, because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray today that you might convict and convince us how often every one of us as followers of Christ is like the Pharisee. Yes, we are. Lord, we don't like to admit that, but if we really look at our life, we have to admit, yes, we are. We take pride in, in, in our service for you. We look down our nose and judge other people that they're not as spiritual as we are. Uh, and we look down our nose and judge other people uh, for behavior that we pride ourselves, that we never do, whether it's drinking or smoking or cussing or chewing, uh, whatever. We can be so self-righteous sometimes, Lord, and so unaware of the beam in our own eye. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Bring us low that you might exalt us. Bring us low that you might show us mercy. Bring us low that we might walk with you in true intimacy and humility. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, thanks for joining us. I want to close with two verses today. We're going to put them up on the screen. First of all, Isaiah 57, 15. Here we go. For thus says the high and lofty one, the one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place. Now watch. And also with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and the heart of the contrite. And second, Psalm 51, David said, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a humble heart, O God, you 
will not despise. God bless you. Hope you have a great week. See you next week, Lord willing, on Live with